Good afternoon. So they asked me to come here and talk about the various successes and failures that we've had at Deal Dash when we've gone abroad. And I originally thought I'd start with the failures, but then I realized it wouldn't serve you breakfast here. So due to the time constraints, we'll have to just focus on some of the successes. But for each one that's worked out, there's been at least a dozen or more that has failed. I started my first company uh, when I was 12 and registered when I was 13. And the basic idea was just to buy components from eBay and put computers together and then sell those computers to my friends and neighbors. And obviously, it's not a very scalable business model, and it's hyper-local. So after a while, when I'd sold about 30 computers, I'd have to go around and fix antivirus software and change screensavers. And it wasn't really what I wanted to do when I grew up. So I knew that and started trying different internet ventures, which none of them really worked out as much as I'd hoped. And then back uh, about 2006, I was wasting time on YouTube. And I saw all these videos with millions and millions of viewers watching them every week. And most of them were not uploaded by big corporations or you know, media companies. But mostly, they were just uploaded by college kids. So I started emailing those college kids or private messaging them on YouTube and offering to buy their YouTube accounts for $30 or $50. And what they had to do is change their password to a temporary password and send it to me. And then once I had the account, I would then connect these videos with companies and targeted advertising for the products. Just put links in the video description. Now that grew really quickly. And we were generating hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue for these companies spending you know, a few thousand dollars buying these videos. Um, but one day I was on the internet and I saw this ad. It said laptop for five euros. So I clicked the ad and I found myself on this penny auction site. And these are the types of auctions where you have to pay to bid. And gullible and excited as I was, I went online and I started bidding for a MacBook Pro. And before I knew it, I'd spent 50 euros Bidding, I didn't win the auction, and I was left empty-handed. And I felt like a big idiot. I wouldn't tell anyone about it. Uh, definitely not come back again. Um, but I got fired up. And the one thing that fired me up the most was that there was just one winner and 100 losers in every auction. And what I wanted to do in that case was to create an entirely risk-free, fair and honest alternative to penny auctions. And the crazy idea that I had and I went around and gathered feedback on was, you know, if you don't win the auction, what if you could just buy the item you were bidding on for its regular store price and you'd get a full refund on the bids you spent trying to win the auction? That would make it risk-free and at the same time you'd have a good chance and good fun trying to win a deal. And uh, we called it the Buy It Now. And as I started planning on, you know, where to start the company, um, I was told by a lot of smarter folks that I should stay in Finland and you know, do it here. And maybe if it works out here, then I guess they thought I eventually could expand to the oil and markets. Or, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, uh, but at the same time, there's a huge market expanding in the US. There was more than uh, 300 competitors at the time. Um, really amazing investors like Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google. At the time, the CEO of Google had invested in companies doing just traditional penny auction activity or pay to bid. At the same time, guys like Niklas Sendström, the Skype founder who sold it to eBay, he had put in millions of dollars through his fund. Um, and all these companies with, with great people working together. Um, but I was still convinced, and our team was convinced, that we had to launch in the US because we had a, something that was a lot more fair and something that consumers would like more and that they would vote for us. It turns out we were right. Customers really loved the buy it now. And it was a simple concept to explain to folks who had lost money on the other sites previously. And it made us risk free. After a couple of years of, of doing it, we've kept on adding more. But even today, still, the buy it now is our key functionality that makes us different. And customers love the buy it now. We generate half of our revenue there. And with so much customer loyalty, which is driven by the Buy It Now, among other things, 
that now we generate nine out of 10 sales from repeat buyers. Nine out of 10 sales come from repeat buyers, which is testament to the type of loyalty and stickiness we've built. But um, to understand Deal Dash, we've expanded into product categories like consumer electronics, kitchen and household items, kids' toys. You have to understand shopping experiences. And there's really two types to shop. The one is when you know what you're looking to buy and you just want the fastest, most convenient way to buy something. And most important for consumers is the price. We compete on price. Amazon.com has a great selection of products. They have great customer service but most of all, they have the best price. But there's also a different type of shopping experience. What if you don't know what you're looking to buy and you go to Discover? And to give you a real example is the shopping mall. You go to the shopping mall with a friend for lunch or dinner. You browse around, you go to different stores, you try different products out, you discover sales, and after a few hours, you walk out with new pair of jeans and new headphones. Well, that's the recreational shopping experience. And in the US and in Europe, people spend more time in shopping malls than any other single location outside home, work, and school, of course. And it's also a big market. Last year, Americans spent more than $920 billion in shopping malls. That's more than three times our entire GDP here in Finland. So recreational shopping is something real. It's something that people enjoy doing. But for some reason on the internet, the only experience that you can choose is still where you have to browse through a static catalog of products, find the one you're looking for, add to cart, check out, and that's it. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but there are people who want a richer social shopping experience. And that's what we do at Deal Dash. We're building the world's largest recreational shopping company. So the bite now is really important. It changed the game from being a gamble, which you might try once or twice, to actually something that people would come and shop. I'm thinking about buying that. I might as well try Deal Dash and see if I can get a good deal. If not, the worst case, I'll pay retail. And later on, we invented and, and implemented proven game mechanics, which are now patent pending in the US. They fuel engagement. We've been able to increase it six folds, and today the average consumer spends 57 minutes for each shopping session on Deal Dash. And anyone who's done traditional e-retail will see rates like two or three minutes per session. So people love to come to Deal Dash, and some people spend four hours a day on the site. Later on, we realized that we had to understand our customers better, and we developed pricing algorithms to predict when customers would churn and leave us and then offer those customers extremely discounted pricing. That's in the buy it now, of course. Even to the point where we have zero negative margin. Because if that's what's gonna take to acquire that customer back or to retain them, many times it's worth doing. Then we launched something called the Deal Dash Promise. The Deal Dash Promise is a no questions asked satisfaction guarantee. If you're not satisfied with your experience for whatever reason, or even if you are satisfied but you still want your money back, you can email us and within 72 hours we'll refund your money, no questions asked, and the biggest deal, you get to keep all the products you bought. And less than 1% of people ask for this, but it makes all the difference in conversion. Finally, and my favorite is the social context. 76% of our shoppers now have one or more friends who already love and use Deal Dash and have said so on Facebook. So it brings social context. You're shopping with friends. So in the last four years since we started, we've been based here in Helsinki and New York City. Um, we opened an office in Silicon Valley one year after our launch, and last year we opened an office in Manhattan and have been focusing our US operations there. Um, we're 63 people, and we have one and a half million US shoppers. Last year was our first profitable year with $8.3 million in revenue. We've quadrupled revenues every year, and this year will more than quadruple revenues, so we've continued growing. And we're also the world's largest provider of pay-to-bid auctions measured by revenue and active user base. There's more than 1,100 competitors. So now I want to talk about the five main lessons we've learned. Uh, well, going abroad, 
the first lesson I learned was to really test our way to successful products. And this was something we learned the hard way. When we started the company, we had a lot of strong opinions and, you know, the website should look this way or customers really want this or it's, it's really about that. And we brought in experts. Designers would come in and they would say, you know, we built 150 websites. We know how to do this. The background should be blue. And the approach didn't really seem to make a lot of sense for us. And the results we were getting weren't really that good early on. So um, we just decided to build both experiences and build as much as we could, since the cost of building isn't that high when you're testing different things like that. And then give them to different customer bases. So different segments would see different things when they came to the website. And then let the customers decide for us. And people would vote with their credit cards. And the one that got the most votes or generated the most sales or gross profit or referrals over a time period was the one that we would go with. And there was no more arguing back and forth about what's the right approach. We let the customers decide. And we get so excited about testing things that we integrated it not just from the design, but to everything from you know, shipping speed. How much should we invest in faster shipping? Every day is worth something to a customer, but how much? What's free shipping or paid shipping? What's the split there? Should we go for it? Should we not go for it? Even human elements, like what should customer service be like? When you email them, should they come back to you with a very formal response? Mr. Wolfram, it's very nice of you to contact our support team. Or should they be very laid back and friendly and personal? And you can really never ending test. And the really neat thing about testing is that when you start testing the things, suddenly you have hundreds of different experiences, each one unique and each one competing against the other. And customer segments have different experiences. And as a customer, you may not even know that you know, you're seeing a different website uh, color of the, of the font or, or maybe even something as big as pricing. But what happens is you get some really good ideas and you see what's working, what's not. So I guess it was Edison that said uh, 100 years ago that, and I paraphrase, to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to, you know, it's 1% invention and 99% perspiration. And I think probably not much has changed since then, except we have some better deodorants today, thankfully. The second lesson I learned was to uh, find the right mentors. When I was starting out, I didn't really have any business connections, and most of my friends were in school or my age. And uh, so I kind of read a lot of books instead. And there was one book in, in, in specifics, but I'm sure a lot of you have read it or, or heard about it. It's one of the best-selling business management books ever written by Tom Peters called The Pursuit of Wow. And it was one of the books I read, and in that book, he went around interviewing entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs in the U.S. and around the world. And, and um, there was one guy named David Friend in that book. And David Friend was quoted probably 12 or 20 times in the book and interviewed, and there were several pictures of him. Um, and he'd built six companies of which he'd taken public on the NASDAQ, two of them, sold other companies for as much as hundreds of millions of dollars, and he just kept on doing it. Every five or 10 years, he'd start a new company and, and, and kind of do it all over again. And it impressed me so much that I figured that I should write a letter to David and, uh, and suggest that I'll work for him for free. And I decided not to do that because I figured he'd tell me I'm overpriced. So instead, uh, I kept on, kept on you know, one day hoping to meet David. And a few years later, through one of my board members, I got on a call with David. And you know, I managed to set up a meeting. And, that led to him investing in DealDash. He got so excited about what we were working on. And today, Dave is on my board, and he's been mentoring me for a few years. And I really, really think that a good mentor can make all the difference, especially for young entrepreneurs like myself. The third thing um, I learned, and we, we, we learned the hard way again, was to know your customer. And we started doing a lot of data analysis. We would look at social. Um, graph and see who are our customer base, which gender, which age, where are they based. Then we started matching that zip code data to um, different U.S. Census data. So we could see, of course, what the average household income was, what the political um, spectrum was, and so on. It was really useful for us, but it wasn't until we started actually getting to know our customers, started talking with them on the phone, started meeting with them, flying them into New York City to spend a weekend with them. And that's really when things really changed for us dramatically. And since then, we've, we've kept this going. And every week, um, every person in our management team does customer calls. And I spend at least a few hours every week talking to customers on the phone 
no matter how busy you are, it's a really good practice because uh, you know they'll they'll keep you in, in in control and make sure you're working on the right things and remind you of what you're doing right and what you're doing not so well. One of my board members when he joined, actually an investor um, who later became a board member, joined the company and and he asked this question for me. He said, William, I see you're spending our money on advertising. Could you tell me how much a customer um, is worth to you? How much are you willing to spend to acquire a customer? And foolish as I was, I scratched my head and looked a little confused. And uh, of course, I figured it out later. And what I realized was that we had an out-of-balance business model. We'd gone out and we'd raised, we'd sold one, th I'd sold one third of the company to my investors. And we had this money and we were, you know, partially had a marketing budget. But I had no idea how much I was willing to spend to acquire a customer. So I was spending more to acquire a customer in the beginning than what the customer was worth. And of course, over time, when we started creating loyalty and getting customers to return more often, spend more money with us for each session, we managed to grow lifetime value of a customer. So over, say, a 12-month period, they would be worth more. Or a 24-month period, they would be worth more in gross profit. And at the same time, we got our customers to tell their friends about the site, which drew down the cost to acquire customers. And today, of course, we have a balanced business model where we spend less to acquire customers than what they're worth. So the secret to marketing success for me has been to pay less to acquire a customer than what they're worth. The fourth thing I learned was to hire the best people. And ever since I made my first hire, I tried to hire some people who are way smarter than I am. And luckily for me, it hasn't been too hard to find those people. And I think we've done a really good job. And there's a story about a company that was looking for their CFO. And I know many of you are CFOs in the audience or soon to be CFOs. Um, and they had a lengthy interviewing process for this important role. So they had um, 100 candidates go through pre-screening processes. And finally, they had three candidates left. They had a lawyer, they had an engineer, and they had an accountant. And the CEO liked to ask a lot of complicated questions, but he liked to end the interviews with simple questions. So when the uh, lawyer came in, he asked the lawyer, what's one plus one? And the lawyer looked into his briefcase and brought up some documents and said, um, hold on a minute. And then he looked up and he said, sir, the answer to your question according to Supreme Court case between state of Georgia and John Smithson, one plus one is two. The CEO thanked the lawyer and sent him on his way, and the next person in was the engineer. And again, the CEO asked the engineer, what's one plus one? And the engineer thought it was a weird question, and probably there's a trick, trick to it somehow. So he pulled out his calculator, and he put in the numbers, and he showed them. He said, well, according to this, it's 2.0000. And again, the engineer went on his way. Then finally, the accountant came in, and the accountant uh, talked to the CEO, and the CEO asked him the same question, what's one plus one? And at this point in time, the accountant stood up and came very close to the CEO and looked around suspiciously and whispered, did he have a specific number in mind? <laughs> and who do you think got the job? So just the same way the accountant knew what the CEO was looking for, we need to know what our customers are looking for. The final and, and perhaps most important lesson for, for us was to learn to not compete on others' terms. When we were facing a fierce competition, you know, I was working from my bedroom, and there were these guys who had raised $25 million um, from guys like Eric Schmidt and at Harvard MBAs, and I'd been to the U.S. twice. And, you know, so it didn't look that good, but I was naive and foolish enough to still do it. And, what we learned was we didn't have to compete on their terms. We couldn't run TV advertising. We just didn't have the budget for it. And we, you know, we, we couldn't do those things, so we had to rely on other ways to do it. And I think what the internet has done is really created what I think Colt Revolver advertised 100 years ago was that uh, it's the equalizer between the small man and the big man. And I think that's, that's what the internet is. It makes David and Goliath be the same size. Each can compete against each other on different terms. And I want to share a story with you to end it with, and this is something that I tell all my employees who join the company. It's about a fellow named Jeff. Jeff had a flower shop, and he'd been running the business for many years, and he had his loyal customers who would come in, and, and life was good. 
One day, Jeff comes to work, and one of the largest flower company retailers have set up store right next to him. And they're running deals like 50% off. And Jeff, he can't compete in the price. And he doesn't, doesn't know anything about marketing. He, he, he doesn't know how to attract customers in, and he definitely can't compete in price. So he struggles. And as more months go by and months turn into years, he starts losing his customers, and he has to let go of some of his employees. Then one day, Jeff comes to work, and an even larger multinational flower retailer sets up on the very other side of his storefront. And these guys are running deals like buy one and get two free. And at this point in time, Jeff really struggles. Even his most loyal customers can't resist the urge of a good bargain. So they go to the other companies. And Jeff has to let go of all of his employees. And times get really tough. And Jeff sits awake at night. And his wife even suggests that maybe he should throw in the towel and think about the other options that he has. But one day, Jeff comes to work early in the morning as usual. And he decides that he doesn't have to compete on these guys' terms. He'll make his own. He climbs up and he puts a big sign that says, main entrance here. And from that day on, Jeff sells more flowers than ever before. And I think that's what we need to do when we exit Finland. We have to compete on our own terms and do like Jeff did. Thank you. Do we have a QA session? Okay, any questions from the audience? Feel free to ask in Swedish. I guess I just started my first company because I didn't have the money to buy a computer, so I had to get it cheaper. And my parents wouldn't budge in the allowance. So uh, I, I had to do that. But I think overall it's a team personality. Everyone has come together with different ideas and different personalities. And I think the mix is what's been successful, not any single person's uh, you know, personality in that sense. And finding people that complement your own personality is really important. Before I close the round, how many investors did I meet? Yeah. That's a great question. I think uh, I didn't keep track because it would have been too, uh, too, too uh, depressing to keep track. Um, but I would say I probably, I mean, I went to these angel conferences. There was one that Finbet all organized here. And I went to that and I managed to get some really great investors. And, um, you know, but it took time. And I probably would have met with a dozen or, or two dozen investors on even one-on-one -on -one meetings before. Uh, kind of the first investor said, "Okay, I'll I'll take this," and um, I think one of the one of the great things about bringing investors, for at least for me, was the fact that a lot of these guys were ex entrepreneurs or ran their own businesses. So not only in the U.S. did we raise some great venture capital, but also in Finland from guys like Guy Head from Robio um, and other really smart investors who can share with their time and and give good advice for us. So. So the way we started was uh, we went and hand out leaflets at the University of Texas, Austin, and just camped out there and gave these leaflets around. I think it was a total waste of time and money now. We like, you know, stayed in a, a sh total shit motel and, you know, it was uh, you know, the cheapest flight through all these different ways. And we did get, a, you know, about 1,000 customers, but um, turns out our target demographic is not young students. Um, so then what we did was we... we started contacting the top 500 most subscribed to YouTube celebrities. Some of these guys have like a million fans, and they're not making any money. At least they weren't back then. And uh, we offered to give free iPads to their fans. They just give free iPads to their fans, the giveaway, and we wanted them to try the site, and if they liked it, do a video about the site. And then that video went into everyone's email. So they had 200,000 fans, everyone got that email. And these were people that they trusted. These were people that had you know, authority and they would talk about deal dash. And that's how we got our first 30,000 users. And that's kind of how we got the first, first set of uh, revenue as well. Oh.
study show that regarding to our media marketing in Finland, our biggest problem is we invest way too much in marketing and we neglect, sorry, invest too much in R&D and neglect marketing. And studies show from all the socioeconomics that actually we should invest 10, 15, and 20 times more in marketing and R&D when going international. So what's your experience going to US? Like when you look at us Finns and Americans and Swedes that have Spotify, that have Tribe, and as Maurits, if you do you think that the, the main problem is I'm not sure I can answer the question. I don't, I'm, I don't know those companies well enough. Yeah. But uh, from our perspective, you know, um, I'm a closet engineer, meaning I really want to be a great engineer, but unfortunately I'm not. But I, I like to sit in and, and understand and learn. Um, we had a really good engineering team, and we didn't have to spend a lot of money on that. Instead, we could use those money, that money to acquire customers. So it was definitely uh, something that we, we split leaning towards the marketing side. Um, we didn't spend any money on acquiring customers um, until we had a we had like a pre-launch. I think like a hundred people showed up. <laughs> it wasn't very successful, but uh, but you know it was a start. And um, and then when that kind of pre-launch phase was over, we spent our, our first uh, first money on advertising. And that was basically flight ticket to to uh, Austin, Texas, and and a bunch of flyers from Vista Print or something. So. Um, and then, uh, then the the YouTube strategy that we used was very cost effective and a good way to get a lot of reach early on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure, we did. It's the biggest sale of the year, and uh, this, so it was a very exciting time for us. Cyber Monday was yesterday, which is the second biggest sale of the year. And Black Friday, last Friday, was the biggest sale of the year. So we've been uh, up and around the office for the last few days, and uh, everyone's working hard to fulfill those orders. Thanks.